Jesus, as the song writer just talked to us about, uh, it helps us to get through the storms we're going to face in life. And all of these individuals that we're looking at in this chapter, what we call the Hall of Faith, these Old Testament biblical characters, uh, they fixed their eyes on Jesus. They, they kept the faith even through difficult times. And as a result, they put their faith in action and they got through many, many struggles. And what we're going to be looking at, uh, some specific examples of that here uh, today. We've been talking about it for the last few months, faith in action, that overcoming hurdles in this life requires that we put that faith in action. We could talk about it all day long. But what do we do when trials really come our way? Uh, do we really have faith in God or we just fall all to pieces and then blame God for all the problems in our life and bail out on God, bail out on the church, quit reading our Bible, quit praying? It really depends on whether or not you have true biblical faith and are you putting that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the same God on the mountaintop as He is in the valley. And so we just simply need to Remain faithful through it all. We're going to look at part two of that. I'm going to try to get through today, if I can, Mike, uh, the first point that I began to look at last week. Remember, Dr. Windsor, my preaching professor, said, it doesn't matter how many points you have, but you got to have at least one. Well, Bob's got me talking so slow up here, I could only get through a half a point last week. I'm going to try to finish up the other half, Bob, if we can. Faithful through it all, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, down to the end of the chapter. Let's stand together all over the building. Here on campus, I don't know if y'all still with us there online. If not, Louis will have it up on YouTube tomorrow. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 32, reading out of verse 40. You fall along as I read, because these now are the words of our living God. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, perform acts of righteousness, obtain promises, shut the mouths of lions, uh, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so they might obtain a better resurrection, and others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. Uh, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, uh, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. All of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. Let's pray together. Our eternal God, we are so grateful for the wonderful inspiration. Well, we thank you that today we can say it is well with our souls regardless of what we're going through because we know that you're on your throne and you're in control and that whatever happens is always best. And so, Lord, we trust you even when we don't understand. And Father, we pray that today you would remove every distraction, both internal and external, let our hearts and our minds not wander, but let us be fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit speak freely into our lives. Speak into the deep recesses of our hearts and minds and draw us near to you and change everybody here. Lord, I pray not only for the ones that are here right now on this campus, but those who are watching live, those who will watch it on YouTube later on. Lord, I ask that you would save every lost soul. And Father, I pray you'd help the church to get serious about the Great Commission, knowing that time is running out. People are dying every second and going to hell. Father, help us to hear from heaven and respond in obedience to whatever you tell us to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, the thing that we must always remember as we read our Bible and study the incredible ways that God worked in and through the lives of the people contained within our Bibles, is that God has not changed. Uh, he is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. What He did in one generation, He can do in another generation. He is no respecter of persons. What He did in one man's life, He can do in another. The same power that worked in their midst and all of these wonderful stories we've been looking at over the last three months is the same power that was raised Jesus from the dead. And listen, that is the same power available to you and I today. 
Listen to what Paul says about it in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. The Holy Spirit that is indwelling every believer, his power is available to transform lives. Uh, we can do anything that God desires for us to do. I told you before that when God makes a promise, the impossible becomes the inevitable. And it will happen. That is what says it will happen if he desires for it to be so. And nothing can thwart his perfect plan. Now we tend to think more highly of biblical characters than we ought to. We look at all of these people that are listed here in this chapter and even other portions of the scriptures, and we tend to put them out on a pedestal and think so highly of them. But what we really understand is that they were just ordinary people serving an extraordinary God. And it really wasn't about them, it was about the Almighty God working in and through them on the basis of their faith in God. Because God has chosen to work in the context of our faith. But these are just ordinary people. Nobody special at all, apart from their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But they struggled and failed in the same ways that you and I do today. For example, Barak, he struggled with his faith. Samson, he struggled with his flesh. And Jephthah, we saw last week, how he struggled with his family. Right. Hudson Taylor said, all God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on his being with them. Amen. Amen. Would that God would stir our hearts today and say to us today, I desire to do a great work in and through your lives today. Would that God would not think that somehow he can only use somebody else but not us. Well, somehow he can only move in some other congregation but not ours. Some other town but not here. Some other nation but not this one. Some other generation but not this one. May God help us understand that he can move just as mighty today in and through our lives as he did to anybody else. Amen. All the grace that we hold on a pedestal, Paul and Peter, Isaiah, Moses, Abraham, Spurgeon, Moody, Johnny Hunt, all of them, ordinary men, Flaw, but served an extraordinary God. Amen. So beginning at verse 33, the writer describes several ways in which God's people had their faith tested. He has been listing different stories. Different Here we go. Now you can hear me, right? Amen. Good. We got to do this now because some folks don't come, and so we got to minister to them too. And so he said, what more shall I say? It's as if the writer is saying, how many more examples do you want me to give you? I mean, good night. I've already given you all these examples. I started out with Abel. I talked to you about Enoch. I talked to you about Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the others. How many more examples do you want me to give you that God is faithful? Now remember our original audience in the original context of this letter. In this chapter in particular, he is speaking to Jewish Christians who are suffering for the cause of Christ. And they're wondering, is this Jesus thing, is it really what I should be doing? This whole Christianity life, is this what I should embrace? Or should I go back to the work of Judaism? And he's challenging them, keep pressing on with Jesus. It is work because Jesus is better than everything else. He's better than Moses. He's better than the law. He's better than the Old Testament covenant. Jesus is better than anything and everything in your life. And he's saying it is worth it. And they're wondering until he inspires them with all of these examples. And he's saying, well, my star, how many more examples are you going to give you? And then he says what every preacher always says, time will fail me. There's never enough time to really get out of the message. Uh, I don't know about you, John, but I'll leave here every single week saying, I have so much more that I could give, but they wouldn't listen long enough. So I had to cut it off. I've heard Johnny Hunt tell me several times, I'm not done, but I'm going to let him close out right here. Y'all all right? Still got more to say. The good thing about glory is we're not going to be rushed. And so he's saying, I wish I could tell you in detail about all these characters, and they certainly would have known who he was talking about, and all the Old Testament stories about them. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, all the prophets. He said, I wish I had more time to tell you about all these, but how much more do you need me to tell you? To remind you that God is faithful. And now he stops dropping names, and now he turns to verse 33. He says, let me just tell you about some of the ways 
And you got to kind of know your Bible to know what he's talking about when he describes the ways in which they serve God. Their faith in God helped them defeat all kinds of enemies and win many victories. So let's take a look at a few of them. And then uh, Lewis has brought us lunch today, so we need to go on a bag and eat lunch today. So he said there, verse 33, some of them, because of their faith, they conquered kingdoms. Now this applies to many of the Old Testament heroes. Uh, one of them would be Moses, whose faith in God helped him. Egypt. Yeah, and by the way, you see the, uh, the point up there. I'm still on, still on point number one, John. That's right. Same as last week. We're talking about the protection of the faithful. And so he says there in verse 33 that some others, what do they do by their faith? They performed acts of righteousness. This was done by the pure lives in which they lived. We think that somehow we're living in the most sinful generation ever. Uh, have you ever read the Bible, what it says about Sodom and Gomorrah? Have you ever read what the Bible says about some of these other pagan nations? And do you remember what we talked about when they walked around the walls of Jericho? What was in those walls? Living babies that they put in a jar and built them into the foundation of the wall. Sin has always been around. There's nothing new under the sun. And yet, in the sinful condition in which they lived, and by the way, when Moses, we looked at him a while ago, Noah, we looked at him uh, early on in the chapter, and God said, when I looked down upon the earth, I found out that every single person there has sin in their heart continually. And I wanted to destroy everything. But they said, wait a minute, now, let me take a second look. I see one guy down there doing pretty good. He's not perfect, but he's doing the best he can to walk with me. So on account of you, Noah, I'm going to allow you to build an ark. And you can save your family and all the animals I'm going to bring to you. So Noah was walking with God in a generation when nobody else did. Wow. Enoch walked with God so well that God said, finally one day, let's just head on back to my house. And he was the first person raptured out of here. He was walking with God when nobody else was. And so they walked with God even in the midst of very sinful cultures. And establishing justice, leaders like Samuel, for example, they practiced righteousness and they challenged others to as well. Listen to what he said in 1 Samuel 7, verse 15 through 17. Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He used to go annually on circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah. What he was doing, he was traveling around. He was a traveling evangelist. He would go around, he would just speak to the people there and challenge them. Then his return was to Ramah, for his house was there. And there he judged Israel and he built there an altar to the Lord. What does that mean? It means he worshipped God. We ought to have a good time with worshipping God. The reason why we don't get so excited about some of these songs because we had to merely worship God all morning long. So we're coming in here, we're asking Chad, hey, stir us up, Chad. Get us all excited like you're some kind of a cheerleader. And sing the songs only that I want you to sing. If you sing the ones that I like, that are my favorites, then I'll shout and sing. Otherwise, I'll just stand here with my arms folded. But when we worship God, we bring our worship with us, it changes how we worship God in here. You know why more people are not here worshiping God today? Because they hadn't worshiped God all week long out there. Right. Y'all all right this morning? So nobody had to get me pumped up this morning when I came in here. I was already fired up. Because I had spent some time with the Lord this morning. Uh, did you acknowledge that 31-day challenge? Today was the last day. How'd you do with it? 31 days reading through the book of Proverbs. You should have closed out with chapter 31 today. What a great, great, wonderful chapter. Sometimes we think about Proverbs 31, we're only thinking about the woman. Uh, Proverbs 31 woman. Well, you didn't read the first nine verses. Had great wisdom in there for everybody else. If you didn't read it, go back and read it later on today. You still got time. Tomorrow is a new month. We're going to throw out a new challenge. We're going to try to help you out the best we can all year long. But you've got to jump on board and do it. And so he said he was going everywhere challenging the people. What, are, what, are they else, what else do they do by faith? He says right there, some of them by faith, they obtain promises. Now we've looked at in the chapter, some of them receive promises by faith only. We saw that with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob earlier. But others saw the fulfillment of those promises. Solomon praised God for this truth at the dedication of the temple. Listen to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. Blessed be the Lord... 
who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Listen to this statement. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he promised through Moses' servant. And so Solomon said, God, when you said you're going to do something, you carried it out every single time. There's not been a single promise you made, God, that was not carried out. Every single thing he said, he did it. Then he goes on to something that we would probably understand a little more easily when he says in verse 33, he also shut the mouths of the lions. Shut the mouths of the lions. Now, you don't have to be that deep of a uh, biblical scholar to understand what he's talking about there. He's talking about Daniel. Uh, his story is found in chapter 6. Again, y'all got to be talking so slow and I'm, time's failing me so I can't give you the whole story, but let me give you the highlights. Daniel 6. What happened in Daniel chapter 6? Uh, Daniel was carried off into a pagan land and there he was trying to serve the Lord the best he could. He was elevated by King Darius who was the king of Persia. But his competition got upset with Daniel because he was doing so well. Any time that you really serve the Lord and God is prospering you and blessing you and, and working in your life, then others will get angry at you and say, maybe he's just compromising. That's why God's blessing him so much. And so they got angry with him. And what they did was they tricked Darius into making a law. They said, hey, don't let nobody else bow down or pray to anybody else but you. And so his pride got in the way. And he said, sounds like a good idea. Let's do it. He went ahead and did it. Well, Daniel was a godly man. He said, I'm not going to bow down to anybody but Almighty God. I don't pray to nobody but God. And so what did Daniel do? He said, I'm not going to hide it. I could go in my, my bathroom and hide there and nobody sees me. But he said, I'm going to do it right here in front of the window. And I'm going to look back towards Jerusalem as every Jew would. And say, so I wish I was back there in the temple. But since I'm not back there, I'm going to look back that way symbolically. And he bowed down and he prayed three times every day like any other Jew would. Well, they found out that he was doing it. It's competition. And then they went to the king and said, Hey, didn't you sign a law saying that nobody can pray to anybody else but you? Well, this guy doesn't listen. He's still bowing down to Yahweh. And he's still worshiping Yahweh. He won't worship you. And he won't pray to you. And so the king was distraught about it because he liked Daniel. But he didn't realize he was being tricked. But even by his own law, even he couldn't get out of it. So he said, I'd like to just let Daniel go, but I can't because the law states, and I'm held by the law myself, that I've got to punish him. Well, the punishment was anybody who did not bow down to him only and pray only to him, but would pray to anybody else, they would get thrown in the lion's den. So he was very concerned because he knew what that meant. I've got to throw Daniel in the lion's den. So he threw Daniel into the lion's den, and he was so worried about Daniel all night long, now here's the king used to living in a lap of luxury. He would throw many lavish parties and hang out and have a fun time. But this night he was very distraught. He was pacing back and forth, worrying all night. I hope that Daniel gets out of there alive. But I don't see how he could with all them hungry lions in that cave. And we didn't feed the lions before Daniel got in there, so we expect they're going to devour him. And I'm going to find him in the morning dead and eaten. Well, Daniel wasn't worried about it. Why not? Because he had great faith in God. So Daniel was resting all night long. Somebody even joked around John that he used one of the lions as a pillow. And so he wasn't distraught because he had faith. But Darius, who had no faith, he was very concerned and spent all night long worrying. Then he ran as soon as morning came to the den to see how Daniel was doing. And Daniel was just fine. So then Darius realized he'd been tricked by these guys. He threw them and their entire families in the lion's den. And before they even hit the bottom, the lions had devoured them. Wow. So the lions were very hungry. But they had one in there who controls the lions. And God made sure that the lions did not touch Daniel. And as a result of that, when he saw how safe Daniel was, he said, wow, his God is different from all the other gods. This God you don't mess around with. So he demanded that everybody worship Yahweh. And he said, I will punish anybody who goes against this God. And then he prospered Daniel. Wow. So then he says, another familiar story there. Verse 34, he quenched the power of fire. 
So by faith, all of these guys, they quenched the power of fire. Who is this? This is talking about our buddy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. From Daniel chapter 3. Well, what happened with them? Well, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a king of Babylon, uh, he was very puffed up and full of pride and arrogance. He made a 90-foot statue. And he said, I want everybody to come and bow down at my statue and worship my statue. Well, these three said, y'all do what you want to do. We're not going to do it. We only bow down to Yahweh. And they said, no, you will bow down or we're going to throw you in this fiery furnace. And they said, you do what you think you need to do. And maybe our God will get us out of this or not. We don't know. But nevertheless, if we burn, we are still not going to bow down and worship you. So you can go ahead and throw us in there, but we are not going to do it. And you know what? Our problem is too often times is that we think, if I know for a fact that God will get me out of the fire, I'll jump in. But if I don't know, then I don't want to suffer for Christ. That's asking too much. So I'll serve Jesus as long as it's easy, but if serving Jesus gets hard, then I might want to rethink this thing. Well, they didn't have that attitude. They said, even if we burn, whatever, God can get us out of there, no problem, or he can let us burn. Whatever he decides to do, that's what's best. And I'm going to just simply do what God says to do. Well, the king got very angry. He told him, heat that fire up. Make it really hot. The guys that opened up the door, they got uh, burned immediately. They all died. And he said, now, throw them in there. But then he looked a second time, expected to see them all burned up. You know what he saw? He saw somebody else in there. He said, wait a minute now. They asked the guys, how many did we throw in there? They said, just three. He said, I see four. And the fourth was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And God spared them in there. He not only spared them, John, he was walking in the fire with them that's why maybe David said in Psalm 23 I'm not afraid to walk through the valley of the shadow of death why not? because you're with me right. so you're not just saying hey run real fast across the other side and I'll catch up with you over there no he was walking with him through the valley he was walking with him through the fire and so he says there's a fourth man in there and it was Jesus listen to this statement their faith kept them from bowing so their father kept them from burning that's a good word. Y'all should have shouted amen right there. Y'all not awake today. And not only did they not burn, but they didn't even smell like smoke. Have you ever been next to a really big fire? Uh, at a church I was at up in Alabama, we had a guy there who was a fire chief, and, and he took me down to one of their fires. And I mean, that thing was huge. That fire was so hot, and we could barely even stand anywhere near it because it was so hot. And you could smell it. And we smelled like smoke even as we walked away from the fire. Because we were so close and the fire was burning so hot. But we didn't even smell like smoke. That was burning. King Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed. Now remember, he's a pagan. He wanted everybody to bow down and worship him. He worships false gods in Babylon. But he was so impressed that like Darius, he too demanded everybody fear God. Listen to what he said. Daniel chapter 3, verse 29 and 30. Therefore, I make a decree that any people nation or tongue that speaks of anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. Wow! And their houses reduced to a rubbish heap. Now he didn't just say any individual. He said, I'll, I'll go to war with any country that even talks bad about him. Wow! He said, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver this way. Well, wait a minute, Nebuchadnezzar. Not even your gods, not my gods. What about you? You're the one that wants anybody to bow down to you. Not me. I can't do it. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Wow. A pagan king, two times, was so impressed by how God moved in a mighty way in and through his servants that they said, let's fear this God. This God is different than all the other gods. Two different kings from two different nations. Why? Because their faith said to them, let's do it God's way, even if we don't understand it. It says in verse 34, they escaped the edge of the sword. They escaped the edge of the sword. For many years, the sword was not far from David as Saul chased him all over the country. We've been learning about that on Wednesday nights. Then it said, from weakness were made strong. Our minds are drawn back to 2 Kings chapter 20, Isaiah chapter 37 and 38. 
What do we read there? Hezekiah. He prayed on his deathbed for more time. Isaiah said that God would be gracious to give you another 15 years, Hezekiah. Many others were strengthened in the midst of their weaknesses. We know that angels came and ministered to Jesus when he was tempted for 40 days in the desert. They also came back and ministered again in the garden right before his crucifixion. Listen to what Paul said about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. He said, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there has been given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. What he said was, God showed me some things, and I would have got puffed up and full of pride and felt like I was somebody special had God not sent me something to keep me humble. So there's a, there's a danger and God working mightily in and through our lives that we might start thinking that somehow it's because of me. Well, maybe because of me, this happened. Maybe I'm somehow special. If it wasn't for me around here, these things wouldn't get done. That church would have never grown had I not been the pastor there. That person wouldn't have got saved if I hadn't given the gospel. And we somehow feel like God really needs us and we're a superstar. So Paul said, God allowed me some glorious revelations and I saw some things. And as a result of spending that time with him in such an intimate way that most people don't get, to keep me from thinking I was a big deal, God sent some things down to keep me humble. Doesn't say what they are. And then he said, concerning this in verse 8, I implored the Lord three times that this might leave me. Doesn't say what he wanted to leave. Doesn't say whether it was an eye problem. Doesn't say whether it was just torments from people in the church or whatever it might have been. He just said, I had some kind of a thorn on my side. And I asked God three times, God, would you take it away? And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Wow. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We need to have that same attitude in our lives. Instead of saying, oh God, all the trials that I'm going through, loved ones dying, finances not where they ought to be, problems in marriage, problems with kids, problems at work, and we whine and complain to God. Instead of saying, God, if you could use these difficulties in my life to inspire somebody else, to help somebody else to hang in there and remain strong. So they would say, well, good night. How in the world did you get through that mess? If it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd have never got through. Right. Hey, strength to go on where we can come from a lot of sources. Strength to go on when we feel down and out and feel like we're ready to give it up can come through a song. These songs today, how they stirred our hearts, reminding us of the faithfulness of God. And that song that I asked Debbie to sign really has ministered to me in the last several weeks. As I think about the death of my mother, not sure where she is. Got to do her funeral here in a couple of weeks. And wondering, what can I possibly speak into the life of the family? When I'm uncertain about where she will spend eternity. It was different with my dad's funeral. He had a strong testimony of being a faithful Christian. And I could speak with boldness and confidence that he is where I long to be. But the songs, how they remind me that God, you are faithful. And it is well with my soul, not because life is easy right now, but because you're on your throne and I have a relationship with you. And songs can really help us and inspire us and challenge us. They can come through other saints. Inspiration to go on. We want to give it up. An encouraging call, a, a, a phone call, a, a letter, a text. Uh, Mike Stone called me the other day. He said, hey, what you up to? I just want to check on you, see how you're doing. Just an encouraging word. Don't have to be on the phone for three hours. Don't have to go out of your way and do a lot. Just a, a little text praying for you. I love you. Hope you're doing well. Just something encouraging. A visit can really inspire somebody. You know what? Somebody out there cares. And we put it out there on Facebook a few weeks ago. Just take a minute and text somebody and say, just want to let you know I'm praying for you and I love you. And how that can really encourage somebody. You never know what a kind word might do in somebody's life. Uh, only God knows what's going on in a person's mind. How many people will, uh, will 
didn't commit suicide or didn't do something harmful because somebody gave them a kind word just at the right moment, didn't even know what was going on in the person's life, just said, I love you, praying for you. That's all they needed to hear. Thank God for encouragers. We got so many critics in the world, we need more encouragers. Scriptures can really be a great source of inspiration to keep going when you get discouraged. A sermon might be just what you need to hear. You ever think about this? That maybe we're complaining to God and saying, God, I wish you'd speak into my life in this subject. And he's saying, we just addressed that issue in a sermon. You missed it. We talked about that in Sunday school and you weren't there. Yeah. It was in your daily quiet time, but you didn't show up. And the very thing that we really need to have, we just figure... I'll just skip my quiet time today. No big deal. I'll catch up with God tomorrow. I'll just skip Sunday school. They understand. It's just too early. I'm tired. I won't be there this week, but maybe I'll just catch up with them next week. Maybe, men, this men's conference that we're going to this weekend will be just what you need, but you're going to miss out on it because you're not going and hanging out with the rest of us. I know I'm going to come back different. Most importantly, inspiration comes from our Savior. When we spend time hanging out with the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can handle anything that the world throws at me if I'm walking through that valley with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why we're falling all apart is because our relationship with God is not where it ought to be. And so what am I trying to do and help you out here in 2021? I'm trying to help you to spend time with God. You can spend time with me, and then it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. But if you'll spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ, I won't have to beg anybody to give money. You know why? Because if you're going to hang out with Jesus, you're never more like Jesus Christ than when you're giving. So if you want to hang out with Jesus, you're going to learn how to be a giver. Uh, you'll be a soul winner if you hang out with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody has to beg you to share the gospel tomorrow. Because what was Jesus doing? He was always on mission. He said, I came to seek and to save those very people that were lost. So if I'm hanging out with Jesus, how can I not want to share the gospel with others? How can I not want to be in church without the Lord Jesus Christ going to be here? How can I not want to sing out these songs instead of saying, let me just sit back. Chad, you got it, don't you, buddy? You just sing for us. You're putting on a concert. No, I want to join in and worship because I'm worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not singing my favorite songs. And so when we spend time with God, He will fix every problem in our life. I always remember that, teachers. Get them to spend time with the Lord, and He'll fix them. You say, I got somebody who's not living right. Get them to hang out with Jesus. He'll straighten them out. It says so they became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. God often reminded them that although they were greatly outnumbered, He delivered them from their enemy's hands. Gideon only had 300 people going around to fight an army that was described as more than the sand on the seashore. And yet he only had 300 people. Not one of them had a single weapon. They had a trumpet and they had a torch. Wow. How did Jericho uh, get destroyed? It wasn't because of Joshua and all his great valiant behavior. They shouted. They walked around the wall and they shouted and it fell down. Well, what do you think all those soldiers were? Up there on top of that wall, waiting to destroy them. And the wall fell down, a good portion of them died. Wow. Well, I've got to move on here. Look at verse 35. It says, women receive back their dead by resurrection. Wow. On a few occasions, God honors people's faith and gave them back a loved one. Now, sometimes we can really have a hard time with this when a loved one is dying because we somehow feel like, well, God, give me some more time. I was watching a movie the other day, and the guy was upset at God because he, he wanted his mother to get better. And his mother prayed, but she had cancer, and she never did get better. So he blamed God for it. And if we don't watch ourselves, we somehow feel like God is some cosmic uh, butler up there to do our bidding. Well, God, I want this person to get better. God, I want this job. I want this marriage to be restored. I want my kids to do this. I want all these things to happen. If God doesn't operate in the way we think he should operate, we somehow feel like God has let us down. And it's his fault that we have all these problems in our life. And so we've got to be very careful when we do that. 
But a few occasions, God did give back a child or a spouse or a parent to somebody who asked for it. Uh, we think about 1 Kings chapter 14, Elijah he brought back the widow's son. We think about 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha brought back the shoe of my woman's son. Right. We think about even in the New Testament. He preached too long. And a guy fell out of the window and died. Paul said, I got more to say. You need to get up and listen to me. So he went back down there in Acts chapter 20, raised a man from the dead and preached for a little while longer. Now let me just tell you, if I'm preaching and I go wrong, don't sit in the windowsill. I don't think God's going to give you the power to raise you from the dead. You're gone. Jesus raised three people from the dead. That's recorded. Lazarus in John chapter 11, a widow's son in Luke chapter 7, and Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8. That's right. And so on occasion, God did use people to bring back the love the dead. By the way, if God gives you that power, and I, I don't bring me back. Because I want to be the Lord of the Lord. And so poor Lazarus, he was hanging out there with God and Jesus, come on back down here. And he brought him out. So leave me up here. But listen, now the greatest resurrection from the dead is not physical, but spiritual. Amen. Can I remind you this morning, I was once dead by trespasses and sin. I once had absolutely no clue who God was, had no desire for things of God, had no desire to read any of these stories, had no clue about anybody we talked about today, had no desire to go to church, had no desire to give, had no desire to serve, had no desire to do anything pertaining to things of God. Why? Because I was dead in my trespasses and sin, but thank God that when Jesus Christ said, John, get up! And I got up! Hey, man, As anyone that raised from the dead, several people have gotten up. I got up. Thank God we got one that got up. <laughs> you, you, you know why you're not shouting? Because you had to spend the time with God. You forgot where He brought you from. Now, I remember where the Lord got me from. I remember that song, Mom. I couldn't even sing the words. And we were singing that wonderful song by Horatio. It is well with my soul when I thought about my sin, all of this, of this glorious thought. Not in part, but in whole. It's nailed to the cross, I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Why am I shouting this morning? Because my entire sin debt was paid in full. I don't have to pay none of it back because the Lord Jesus Christ, He said, John, give me the best you can, buddy. Here, here's a Bible. Figure it out yourself. No, the Lord Jesus Christ raised me from the dead. Can you understand that a dead person does not even know they're dead? Experiencing God from any black people. Right. That look where God's at work and join 
there's not a single person in this room. Well, we still got them online. There's not a single person online who does not need to get on their knees and talk about waiting. Not one. There's not a single person here who does not need to ask the Holy Spirit to examine me. Am I truly born again? God, where is my passion gone? Why am I not more fired up this morning? God, how's my giving? How's my soul winning? If I claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the question we used to ask years ago? What would Jesus do? What would he do? Well, we know what he did because he did it. It's in the book. We gotta say, well, God, help me to be a giver like you. Help me to be a soul winner like you. Help me to be a servant like you. Help me to be a lover and a forgiver like Jesus. And that's all about the past. People crying out to God saying, oh, God, have mercy on me. I have drifted so far from you. And maybe today, you have no idea why I'm fired up. Because you never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never born again. How many people are lost in the church members? What a scary verse to read in the Bible that Jesus is going to say to those who claim to be Christians. Depart from me. I never do. Never. Not that you lost your salvation, you never had it. Well, wait a minute, didn't they call the Lord? They said they were Christians. Didn't they say we performed all kinds of miracles? And we preached, we did all these things, signs and wonders. He said, good for you. But you're never going to get because those things will not save you. And I can work in anybody's life, even if they're lost. Judas was lost, he died and went to hell. And yet all the same things that every other one of the disciples did, Jews didn't say. When he said about two by two, he was out there with them. They performed all those miracles out there with them. Hanging out with the very one we never really knew. God knows we wouldn't keep preaching a book that we don't even believe ourselves about a God that we don't have a relationship with. That we sing songs about a God that we don't even know. We tell somebody else about a God that 